What makes pride? We've been taught that pride is sinful, selfish, arrogant, deadly, but we know better. Pride is not deadly, hate is. Hate is the violence trying to make us small, silent, invisible, extinct. Pride is the extravagant, unapologetic embrace of our wholeness. Pride is the affirmation of our humanity. Pride announces we are here on our own terms. And for pride to be real, it must confront all the hate that seeks to destroy. Pride must battle white supremacy. It must end poverty. It must uproot patriarchy. Pride must liberate, house, clothe, and build. I am Melissa Harris Perry, and this month I'm partnering with PFLAG, the nation's largest family and ally organization, to lead a series of conversations with BIPOC, queer, and trans folk who are organizing transformational work in our communities. Join us every Tuesday in the month of June on PFLAG.org. Welcome. I'm Melissa Harris Perry, and I'm your host this month for a series of conversations we are calling What Makes Pride? Each week during the month of June, I'll be joined by leaders who are tackling critical issues facing BIPOC, queer, and trans communities through advocacy, activism, arts, and what we'll call creative maladjustment. This week, we're discussing policing, criminalization, and incarceration. But before we meet our guests, I want to ask a question. What is justice? Now, it's a question that many have been forced to grapple with during the past year, as our nation has once again been confronted by the public slayings of cisgender Black men and Black women, by police officers who are presumably dedicated to serving and protecting our communities, police whose presence, choices and actions evoke more harm than they mitigate and provoke more violence than they prevent. And even when it seems our communities have scored a victory, like the jury finding that Derek Chauvin is guilty of murdering George Floyd, we're still forced to ask, is, is this really justice? In fact, can there be justice? What is justice when the system itself is biased, broken, rotten. Now, as much as these questions might be new for many Americans, they're almost ancient for BIPOC, queer, and trans folk whose lives are marked from childhood to adolescence to adulthood by policing, arrest, incarceration, and systemic abuse. The Prison Policy Initiative stated the issue plainly during a March briefing this year, saying, quote, the data are clear. Lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer people are overrepresented at every stage of the criminal justice system, starting with the juvenile justice system. Queer and trans folks are more heavily policed, more frequently arrested, more likely to be incarcerated, and are subjected to brutal and inhumane conditions and treatment during incarceration. And these injustices are particularly acute for BIPOC, queer, and trans folk. Let's just look at some of the statistics. One in five young people in the juvenile carceral system are lesbian, gay, bisexual, questioning gender nonconforming, or transgender. Queer and trans folk experience much higher rates of arrests than their hetero and cis peers. And this is especially true for trans women and queer femmes. And at the intersection of anti-transgender bias and structural racism are the devastating realities of criminalization and punishment for BIPOC trans folk. According to the report, Injustice at Every Turn by the National Center for Transgender Equality, BIPOC transgender people are disproportionately harassed by police and the lifetime rates of incarceration for BIPOC transgender people are simply staggering. Nearly half of all Black trans folk are incarcerated at some point in their lives. Half. 
I mean, is this justice? Is it justice when incarcerated trans people are denied routine health care? Is it justice when trans women are incarcerated in men's facilities? Is it justice when trans people are punished with solitary confinement, a practice the international community still defines as torture? Is justice possible when trans folk are routinely harassed, beaten, and raped while in custody? I think the answer is clearly no. This is not justice. This is cruelty, brutality, bias, racism, hate. But even as we decry and denounce the injustice of our current system, we find strength and hope and, yes, pride in the BIPOC, trans, and queer folk who are demanding an end to these systems and insisting through advocacy, organizing, and policymaking that justice can, in fact, be real. So joining me now to discuss the injustices of the current system and the vision of a more just world is Dominique Morgan, an award-winning artist, activist, and speaker currently serving as executive director of Black and Pink. Now, Black and Pink was founded in 2005. It's a national abolitionist organization dedicating to ending criminal punishment. It has 11 volunteer-led chapters with more than 20 thousand current and formerly incarcerated LGBTQIAS2 plus and people living with HIV AIDS members across the country. Dominique Morgan, thank you for joining me today. Good afternoon slash morning, Melissa. <laughs> I'm so glad to be here. I am so thrilled to have you here and um, I want to start um, by just Yes. Reflecting on something that you uh, said in your TED talk, um, that you were in solitary confinement for nearly 1 million minutes, 18 months, and that no one ever just says to you, I'm sorry, I'm sorry that that happened. And so I just really want to start there by saying, um, I am so sorry that you as a human had to experience torture at the hands of the state in that way. Thank you so much. Now, can you start with me by going back to the first question that I asked, which is what is justice and what does it look like for you? I think, um, at Black and Pink, and I think in conversations every day, um, that definition of justice is something that folks struggle with, right? Because um, what makes it easier for us as community is to have one shared definition around something, to build answers and systems to address that shared definition, be a good, bad, or in between. And one of the reasons that I believe our justice system is ill-equipped and inept to do what we say it's going to do is because the definition of justice is individual. Just hmm. like happiness, just like joy, look like just like sadness, anything that's an experience, right? We talk about justice as a system, as a business model. The, the idea that you've actualized justice is a feeling. And so like any other feeling, it's going to be based on what that person um, receives it as and how they identify it as. And so um, I, I have a dream of us having a, a time where we reach a space in our community where we have a community based definition that folks feel is very comfortable and that addresses everyone's needs that everyone can have access to it. Right. Mm -hmm. um, justice right now is kind of like being a billionaire only so many people are going to touch that, right? You use it a lot, but only so many people are going to touch it. Um, and that's in a community sense. Personally, I don't really talk about justice anymore because of that reason. And it's more about opportunities of restoration and transformation. And, mm -hmm. and when I talk about that, I look for restoration first, right? How can I do the work, whether it's in myself and, and, and the harm that I've experienced or harm that I've been involved with with another individual or the community at large? Like, where is the opportunity for restoration? Um, and then 
there are moments when you're like, yo, like this can only be restored to, to a point. Um, and I, I use the kind of visual, you know, if you have a glass and it's broken and it's like a large piece there, you can glue it back in and you may be, be able to still use that glass cup. You may see the chip, but you'll still be able to use it. If you break it into a, into many, many pieces, you can try to glue it back together, but something's going to feel insufficient. It may not even be uh, something that can be used the same way, but if you take that glass and you heat it up, you may not make another cup, but you could turn it into something else. So for me, it's about restoration and transformation. And, 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 and around that, it's what feels like I'm getting further from yesterday or, or, or the harm of last month, or the harm of um, my incarceration. What, what, what is the feeling that makes me um, have those reset moments of okay, I'm, I'm kind, of, I've taken some steps away from that, and sometimes that can feel small, and sometimes that can feel large, um, and uh, but, but that's, but that's really how I look at it, and it allows me to maintain my abolitionist values. It allows me to offer grace to myself and others, and also. I hope allows me to be a role model in the fact that none of this stuff is paying by the numbers. It's not one plus one equals two. This is hard people stuff. And anytime hard people stuff is happening, um, we, we, we have to offer a lot more time and no one wants to wait to heal, right? Um, mm -hmm. But I think that restoration and transformation is definitely worth the wait. I love the language of restoration and transformation. I will always cite you when I use it, but just know I'm going to be using that a lot All at this right. point. That is really, um, and I also appreciate hard people stuff. I may be using that in even in my parenting because hard people yeah. stuff is is real. So, so walk with me through a little bit of time here, black and pink, and maybe you'll notice I'm wearing black and pink because I'm yeah. so jazzed up by um, all Turn the work you are doing. <laughs> but black and pink was founded in Boston in 2005. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah. I'm just kind of interested thinking about, we're talking now about what, 15, 16 years. Um, we're at our 16th year now. Yeah, how has the work evolved over that time? You know, I became the executive director in January of 2018. So I've been the ED for um, over three years at this time. Um, Jason Lydon, who is our founder, is an incredible human being. Jason is now based in Chicago and is a Unitarian pastor and continuing his work and his 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 life work in in, in a different way. I think the early days of Black and Pink were centered around people. The, 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 the approach of Black and Pink today is centered around people. When we look at the evolution of how we center people, I think that's where you see how, you've seen some shifts and changes that began with the Pen Pal program, that began with um, our newsletter. And at that time, it was a bunch of college students in Boston stapling booklets together and, and mailing them inside to our inside family. To, you know, I um, was a adolescent uh, sex educator before I came to Black and Pink. Um, really believe in the power of of a public health approach that's people centered. As someone who really received a lot of opportunities from public health programs when I was released from prison, whether it was support around paying my bills or you know I, I, my I adopted my youngest sister, helping to pay for clothes for her or just mm -hmm. foods, right? Um, and I so I don't think the programs are bad. I think how people are implementing and and and, and living out the programs mm -hmm. um, aren't the best for the people they want to serve. And that's and that's where you've seen the shift where you know we definitely take it to the streets. We definitely are engaging in community protests and things of that nature. Um, but I believe it needs to be a 360 approach because um, how can I ask someone to go out and, and stand and march and I don't, they don't know where they're gonna sleep that night. Um, how can I bail someone out of prison? Like bail support programs are radical and amazing, but if a person went to jail because they were stealing a sandwich and I bail them out and when they walk out of the jail, I'm not there and they're still gonna need a sandwich in an hour. How are we breaking slash starving the system? Uh, many people think about abolition and system dismantlement, you know, as, you know, Molotov cocktails and burning things down. And Jason Lydon said, it was at the Lydon House opening. We opened our community house in Omaha, Nebraska on February 16th, 2020, which is the day that I had gotten out of prison 11 years earlier. And, and he said that we can starve the system too. 
Mm. So black and pink is really, we, we want to dismantle it, but we also have recognized that the more of us that we can keep together, the more of us that are engaging in defining their uh, definition of liberation and building strong community, the system will start. Without bodies, these buildings will not be necessary. And so while you uh, see some of my amazing comrades focusing on the building, the systems that perpetuate the building and so on, um, my leadership style is I want to get my people out. I want to keep them out. Um, and because when the building comes down, I don't want to have to do a rescue mission. I want to know it's mm. empty. And I want to know that we're just getting rid of buildings because abolition is not about harming and dismantling people. Mm -hmm. It's about dismantling systems. People are not systems. Can we talk about Leiden House? Because um, I'd love for you to talk a little bit about why it yeah. is um, so groundbreaking. But but also, even as you said it in that moment, and I was remembering from the moment that I read it, I thought, wait a minute, February of 2020. And so then the world ends, you know, three weeks after yeah. that, right? Within, within three or four weeks, obviously the world doesn't yeah. actually end, but it felt like that in many ways. And here you just opened this space. So I want to know more about it, but also sort of how you've traversed um, the COVID year. Yeah. You know, Leiden House came from... Um, when I was when I when I was released from prison, it was a Sunday. The day we opened Light and House, February 16th, just happened to fall on the Sunday again. And um, I I hadn't been outside of a prison in almost a decade. And luckily, I was able to go home to my to my mother. But there was still this idea of where is my where are my people? Where do I fit in? What do I do? And I would I would get on a city bus and just ride the bus all day and just try to you know think and see and my city had changed. And I got a job um, and I was working multiple jobs, but it was it was an existence that really felt akin to my incarceration because I wasn't like living out my life. I just was stuck on while I'm no longer imprisoned. And there's a, there's a moment I realized that um, Prison is walls and prisons are other systems and other uh, other tangible ways that it shows up. And when I came into Black and Pink, I wanted to create the space that I wish I had walked home to. And so Leiden House at its core is about people. It's not a halfway house. It's not a three quarter, all the language that the system uses. It's a home. Um, it's a sort of home we wanted to construct it to where I would want to live there. And there are many days when I walk in there, I'm like, dang, I wish, I need to wait. Where we get this carpet at? Does anybody know where we <laughs> bought this carpet from? And I can't tell you how many people have, seriously, how many people from all across the country will walk in there and be like, girl, where you get that chair from? Right? Because we really were intentional. And I'm really also proud that, you know, it was a black black woman who who helped us build and decorate that space out. Mm -hmm. um, the rooms, no one shares space rooms. It's this is a room, this is your space. Um, they get a stipend to decorate their space. They get to customize it and personalize it. Every room in Light and House is named after someone who was pivotal to Black and Pink's history. Like one of our bedrooms is named after Douglas Rogers, who is the first Black and Pink member, um, all the way to our healing space is named after Brandon Tina, which is probably the most well-known LGBTQ plus story from Nebraska, you know, where I'm from. We wanted to acknowledge that. Um, Light and House is about community. So to talk about Light and House opening at the top of the pandemic, and I would say the world stopped for the people who are already trudging through and slowly going through the world, it absolutely stopped for us because we were already going at a snail's pace, right, trying to get ahead. And then you're just like, my goodness. Um, what I will say is, and I was I was talking to um, my deputy director of People Power and um, Partnerships, Andrew Allman, last night about it, is that it was our shelter. We worked from there at the start of the pandemic. So when we were afraid to be around other people, we had a safety space there at Leiden. We had folks moving in because it just had to happen. We yep. ran our COVID response fund where nearly $100,000 went back out into the United States. And last but not least, we people knew that if you had nowhere else to go, you could come to Leiden. And as queer and trans people, GNC folks, the most oppressed folks in our communities, a running theme is the lack of home. A running theme and, and, and home and the foundation and the platform and how home can stabilize you, right? And so that's what it was. And so it was an amazing. And now we're we're evolving into the Opportunity Campus where we're looking to radically change how LGBTQ plus youth and um, uh, youth who are living with the experience of HIV and AIDS in our communities are, are supported, how we're engaging in their autonomy. We 
talk about abolition. We're so excited about adults being able to do what they want to do without oppression. Um, the most radical adults think that it's our job to oppress young people, and I don't believe that. And so uh, Leiden House gave us a great opportunity to learn at, at the hardest time. And now we know going in Opportunity Campus, if, if we could handle Leiden House in 2020, we can handle 10 young people and, 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 and a whole school and shenanigans that we're trying to build out in the next two or three years. So it's interesting to hear you talk about this sort of discourse of um, uh, the control of young people. And obviously in state legislatures across the country right now, part of what lawmakers are doing is attempting not to control just young people, but quite specifically trans young folk who are um, wanting to do very simple things like play sports or have the medical services and prescription care that they need. I, 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 I can't quite express the level of frustration I feel that, again, in the context of COVID-19 and all of the uh, crises that we're facing, that state governments would think that this is the way to spend their time. But can you talk to me also about how that creates more pathways for policing, for incarceration, right? How this kind of targeting by lawmakers of young trans folk actually like creates that pathway. Yeah. Well, I want to, I think it's important to go back to this idea of abolition because what what folks will most often say when they're talking about black and pink, when they're talking about me, I think when they're talking about abolition period, it's like prison abolition. We are abolitionists and 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 for me, and, and I wanna thank Mayam Kaba for gifting me with a beautiful space to engage in the, the 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 world of abolition from a black woman, which was a powerful shift for me. Um, we want to dismantle any systems that don't allow folks to touch whatever their version of their best self is, right? And so when we're looking at young people, when we're looking at these laws they're passing, be clear, the white trans young person that has a support family, that has the funds to go the next state over to get their hormones isn't going to be affected. It's the young person of color who was already struggling for to even identify with their pronouns. It's a young person of color who doesn't have health insurance to go get their school physical, more or less be able to go somewhere else and use their Medicaid or their state assistance to get um, um, hormone replacement therapy in other space or find a therapist that is affirming to their needs, right? Um, it, is, it is the truth that these laws, like, at mo like all laws, are going to oppress and impact black and brown folks the most in, in addition in that intersection of oppression identities that are pressed, always I'm uplifting young folks who are system involved, who uh, even if they have a parent that is loving and strong, the system prevents that parent from being their first advocate. Um, these young people are depending on people that they may never see that are making decisions about what they can have health wise and so on and so forth. These are the young folks who, are all, who have already lost so much power and influence over themselves that are going to lose more. And the last thing I will say is, I think it is ridiculous that we as a society, we as adults in the community, spend 18 years um, trying to rob young people of choice and power of themselves, especially queer and trans young people. And then magically when they turn 18, we're perplexed why they are not knowledgeable, aware, and equipped to navigate this world as these you know, well-rounded adults we want them to be. Being queer, being trans, as a kid who came out when they were 13 in a group home in South Sioux City, Nebraska, my gender identity, my orientation didn't prevent me from being the best Dominique I could be. What I've realized is that people were trying to tell me what that best person was and it didn't align. And so I fought against it. And the minute that I was able to establish my own def definition, there was a shift. And I've seen it with so many young people I every day with young people. So we just need to understand that this is a domino moment. And I don't want people looking at data you know, five years from now, oh my God, why are there so many young folks in the South who are in the system? Because there's so many young folks in the South that you all have built laws to ensure that they will never feel like their best self. And I know when I, you know, I know some folks, if they get their coffee, they turn into the Tasmanian devil. Um, so you just imagine when the world is telling you, you can't find and touch any of the things that make you your best self, what your life experience will be like. So often when we talk about um, policing, 
criminalization, incarceration, the public conversation, the media conversation, the public policy conversation immediately goes to basically traffic interactions with police officers and cisgendered um, black men, right? That's, that is, that's how it gets framed. And yet when we look um, not only at data, but at lived experience, we know that that is certainly a critical and important issue, but but only one. So can you help us to think um, about what aspects, what realities of BIPOC, queer and trans folk really right. challenge like these assumptions or this public discourse in terms of who is being uh, criminalized and and where what those sites of interaction with, uh, with policing or with the system look like? Well, first, I want to uplift that none of us know um, the sexual orientation of Orlando Castile. None of us know um, the, the, the gender representation of George Floyd. And I say that to say that um, they'll all, they will always center race. They never discuss any other ideas that that person may possess. Um, and really, the only time they talk about the impact of policing or harm on the, on the LGBTQ spectrum is when it's a trend. That's really the um if it's if it's if it's a black person that's queer it's like this was a black male such and such and such even even up until you know this last week there was a black trans woman that was that was taken from us and 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 and, and the language was around the cisness blackness of the person so i just wanted to put that out there mm-hmm. anyone who does not align with that has been set by our society is going to be more apt to be touched impacted by the system folks are the most unlikely to align with what we've identified as our norms in our society, our queer and trans people, gender non-conforming folks, black trans women. When we think of black trans women, when we think of oppression that black sister women experience, we need to know that that's amplified for black trans women because we're not only the horrible harm that black trans women experience, we are in this where we're on the margins of that. And so when we look at policing, policing isn't, police harm isn't about shooting folks or harming folks. It's the lack of police safety. There's so many black trans women that if the police actually kept them safe, may depend on them more. Um, the New York the New York Pride just said that, you know, they're not gonna allow police for the next five years. And I had a conversation with the police, uh, one of the police folks from Omaha saying that, you know, if queer, and, and, and trans police officers were out here maybe trying to protect black trans women, maybe the conversation would be different or, or the, 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 the embracing would, would look different. And, and that's my concern is that not only is the support that they perpetuate to provide not happening, when they do show up, the harm is either exacerbated or um, it's, it, it's, it's, the, it's the, you're trying to negate their identity. I shouldn't have to train a police officer how to use pronouns. I shouldn't have to train a police officer um, in, 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 in the ways to navigate my name, right? These, these sort of things are really important. So I just, I, I wanted to say that, that this is, um, we're talking about police violence, but we need to talk about violence in, in, in this hallway. And also talking about black trans women that are being harmed by policing does not mean that we're trying to negate the harm that happens to cisgender black men. And, and and we as black people, and that's, you know, I'm a black trans woman. I love, I love my people. I like, I love black men. I love, like, that is who I am. We have to do the work to, to, to be comfortable being decentered and knowing that means that we are not being left out. Um, and that is something we can do that does, that's not predicated on the permission of white people or systems of oppression. So when we are, so Pride is coming up, but Juneteenth is coming as well. So when we're having those conversations, let us make sure that they're nuanced and they're at the intersections of all of the ways that black people show up, especially black young people. Uh, Dominique, you are doing all kinds of hard people work today. My last question is just this, where can people find you and how can they support your work? One, thank you. I've always like loved you. Like <laughs> I was I was telling a friend, well, because in, in Nebraska, in the prison system, we had like six channels. 
So I was not a kid that really, like I didn't watch the news growing up, but I would watch your show. It, yes. it, it, it never felt, it, it, it felt like I was learning things. You know, I was like 22, 23 at the time, mind you. Um, felt like I was learning, but it felt like I also was having a conversation with my good sister. Um, oh, I always felt you. like that show should have been on BET. Um, so <laughs> I just want to say that. I messed with you the long way. Um, listen, outside of that, I love you can find me on, listen, all the things. Instagram, I'm the Dominique Morgan. On Twitter, it's the Dominique M. My personal website is DominiqueMorgan.com. You can engage, not follow, engage with our work at Black and Pink at www.blackandpink.org. And Black and Pink National, us, is, or some form of it, is a way you can find us on Twitter instagram or facebook please engage um because we're not gonna find the world we say we want to have with just a few of us getting to the other side there need there's, there's gonna have to be this critical mass and we're all essential especially young people and and i'm really glad y'all are having these conversations and i'm so thankful you were um you invited me and i was so great to be able to talk to you today Dominique Morgan, executive director of Pink and Black, Black and Pink. You made my whole entire day today by, um, by telling me that I got to spend any time with you in the context of um, your incarceration in Nebraska. Like that, every once in a while, I remember that, um, that maybe what we were doing was trying to make some kind of difference. So I really, I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Now, up next, we have original music by Tomu DJ. Now, if you've been watching this series all month, you already know that Tomu DJ's unique and engaging sonic style is gonna be a great break for us. But if you're new to our series, I'm just gonna tell you right now, you're gonna get into it. Tomu DJ is an American producer and DJ best known for her groundbreaking self-released projects on Bandcamp. And you can find and follow her work at Tomu, T-O-M-U, DJ, on all platforms. Stick around after our music break, because I'm going to be talking with our next guest, Janetta Johnson of the TGI Justice Project. And you do not want to miss this conversation. Joining me now is Janetta Johnson, executive director of TGI Justice Project. She survived three and a half years in federal prison and has been an activist and advocate in transgender communities since 1997. TGI Justice Project is a group of transgender, gender variant, and intersex people living both inside and outside of prisons, jails, and detention centers and creating a united family in the struggle for survival and freedom. Janetta Johnson, thank you for joining me today. Hi, thank you very much. Absolutely, thank you for sticking with us. Listen, I wanna start by getting real on a, um, on a story. Can we talk about Ashley Diamond and kind of the 
the long story of both her her groundbreaking work and then rearrest, reincarceration, and and, and what's going on with her now. Um, there, so we're working with her attorney and supporting her while she's currently in the system, and we're trying to bring a little bit more light and support to her case. And um, it really saddens me that they re-arrested her for just going to participate in an event that was specifically designed to empower transgender people and lift them up. And um, that's a major disappointment that that's the criminal justice system that we have. Yeah, it, it feels to me in some ways like her story is one that um, represents nearly every aspect of like the harm, the trauma, the violence and the abuse that the criminal justice system really lays on black trans women. And, and I'm wondering, if we wanted to just begin somewhere, for example, with the work that you do, where can we begin to start to mitigate some of these harms? Well, we're currently working on a few bills, but my biggest thing at TGIJP is we're trying to create better opportunities for transgender people that are coming out of um, jails and prison. And part of it is because when I did my time in jail, there were so many black trans people that were inside the system. And I would try to be as much support as I possibly can. You know, I made a bad decision 2008, 2009. I ended up in prison and there I sat in the county jail for about 14 months. And I just paid attention and I, um, I took the liberty to interview um, every transgender person that was in the jail, um, most of them were coming in and out. And I would try to give them information and resources so when they get out, but I realized that um, there was no place for them to go. There was no place. It was all the old familiar place that they were trying to get out of. So I took my liberty and I said, how did I get back in the system after I worked so hard not to put myself in a position to um, um, participate in any behaviors and try to be, I mean, not even jaywalking um, because mm -hmm. of, I don't want any police contact. And, but um, like a lot of the people just didn't have the access getting out and I said, I'm gonna develop a reentry program. And then I was planning this out and writing this out. And I was gonna go and ask all these built business and make them familiar with the transgender community and ask them for an opportunity for employment. And then I thought about it and thought about it. I'm like, I'm not going to ask these people nothing. I'm gonna create these opportunities within our organization so that we can know that trans people are being supported. So that's when we decided to create our reentry program. So we have a reentry social economic justice program, and we pay um, our participants to work within our organization. We support them in leadership development, going back to school, and an opportunity to earn an income. Reentry should not come, should definitely come with a paycheck. And that's the work that we do. That's our goal. And we provide, we support people in housing. I mean, the last couple of years has sort of kind of been amazing for us at TGIJP because pretty much we've been able to catch just about every black and brown person mm -hmm. coming out of um, prison. And um, because I remember the first day that um, this was about two years ago, and um, that's when I bought me a new pair of tennis shoes because I was like, I'm going to find safer housing for my community. Mm -hmm. And um, it wasn't until somebody showed, a trans person showed up at my door after doing 30 years and I had no place for them to go. I had no place for them to go. And I was not about to put them in a shelter, you know? So um, that is the thing that really strengthened me because also um, Michelle Alexander, she was here and she spoke and she spoke about, um, we're an abolitionist, we're an abolitionist, we're abolitionists, but also what resources are we saving up so when the people come home that we can create the opportunities so that they don't end up in these systems um, trying to survive again? I, I feel like um, for folks who don't have family who are in the system, 
that reentry is, um, it's almost like a, a theory, right? So you're like, oh, like, uh, you know, people maybe watch Hollywood movies. And so they think, oh, you know, you get out and they give you like a little something. But, but I mean, sometimes it's the middle of the night or sometimes it's the weekend or some, you know, and, and nothing you, you come up with. I mean, you talk about reentry should come with a paycheck. It doesn't sometimes even come with bus fare. The, um, the extent to which, we are creating in a streetum system, right? A system that is really just one pathway to come back in that revolving door. So I, I love that your perspective was in part, we can't ask folks for it, we gotta build it. But I'm wondering about the difficulty of building it for communities that are already so under-resourced. What are you building from? Where are, where are you gathering the resources? Well, it's been a lot of hard work. Um, it's been a lot of hard work and a lot of um, moving on faith. And um, our work is very passionate. We go very hard for the community that's coming out to reduce their risk from re-returning and also empowering them and helping them with both hard skills and soft skills. Because when you do this work in this community, it's time. It, um, I want to make sure that um, people are in a position to support the next person coming out and being there for the next person not coming out. Um, yeah, that I think that's the most important thing is that we save ourselves. I mean, I'm a former sex worker and I spent years on those streets waiting on somebody to come and save me and put me up. And one day it just clicked. You're the one you're waiting for. <laughs> you are the one you're waiting for, you know? And that I had to work really hard in order to be in a position to help others. But, and most of my work, it, I mean, don't get me wrong, it was about me. It was about me because it was about me making sure that I could take care of me and I had the strength and the courage that I need to do in order to help the broader community and especially the black, black trans community because I grew up with black trans people and we all did the best we could with what we had in order to take care of each other and support each other. And um, yeah, so. So I wanna talk about um, a moment that I, I found to be a really difficult intersection in terms of thinking about justice for black folk, but also for people who are survivors of and vulnerable to sexual violence. And this was like, this moment that should have been celebratory or at least celebratory in some sense. And it was when the jury found Derek Chauvin guilty of the murder of George Floyd. Now that didn't bring George Floyd back. It, there were certain kinds of reparation that could never happen, but at least it felt like, okay, we might get some measure of justice. But as I was watching on social media, one of the first things that bubbled up was this language about rape and that, um, that, People were happy about this idea that Derek Chauvin would go to jail or prison and that he would be raped or sexually assaulted in prison. And that was a kind of just punishment. And, and as a rape survivor, it just it turned my stomach that, um, that we would think of, of rape in the context of state confinement as something we would ever cheer for. And it also just made me think about the folks who are actually most vulnerable to that are, are not the former police officer. It's actually queer folk and trans folk and particularly queer and trans folk of color who are incarcerated. So can you talk to me a little bit about the realities of that vulnerability? Um, I don't believe that's true at all, at all based on my experience of being incarcerated. He will be celebrated. He will be welcomed by corrections, warden, um, and a lot of white supremacy groups in the city. And I, I have a strong belief that George Foreman, I mean, George, I mean, um, George Floyd, Derek Chauvin, I looked in his face in that videotape. And the thing that saddens me that it looks like he took a lot of pride in that murder of George Floyd. And another thing that, um, really um, left me 
feeling un that leaves me feeling uncomfortable. A lot of the police and a lot of state fa sanctioned violence, there's so many people out there that would love to just kill a black person because that's their history, that's their lineage. And um, just like we carry the, uh, the historical trauma as black people, they carry the historical trauma of being white supremacy and um, feeling like um, black people still belong to them and they can do what they want to do and not get caught. And I also wanted to say as an abolitionist, as an abolitionist, I just want to say, um, I don't, I, I just want to say that I'm an abolitionist. I don't want to see nobody go to jail or prison. I want the whole system dismantled. And I mean, I used to think of all these things of what we can do to dismantle the um, criminal justice system. But, and I don't want to create jails. I don't want jails. I don't want nobody to go to prison. But I feel like I want to make sure I explain this right. I'm not saying put him in jail, but what I'm saying is as an abolitionist, and the work that we're doing to abolish the prison and the criminal justice system. And he should sit his ass in there until we get there. I love you a lot right now. Well, we're gonna leave him running around. I love that. That is maybe, I have been trying. I mean, I just feel like you just freed something on the inside of me because I have been really trying to figure out how do we reconcile this question of, of seeking justice for that kind of harm while still maintaining that we, that we want to abolish and dismantle this system. And I do appreciate that one way to reconcile that is to say, well, since we have not dismantled it yet, you can feel free to have a seat in it until we do. And I say particularly him because of the historical police violence and um, and yeah. Yeah, I will, I will take that as accountability. Is there any other, um, well actually let me ask it a slightly different way. You all are working to amplify a lot of key stories. You all are working around um, the work that you're doing for reentry. Where can people find you? Where can they find the organization? And how can they support your work? We're located in um, San Francisco. And our website is tgijp.org. And yeah. And we're also working on a capital campaign. And that um, we're working on a capital campaign. We're trying to buy, buy a building in San Francisco. and. It's been very difficult. I'm upset because there's no black trans businesses in San Francisco. Black trans people don't own no business, no property, no nothing. And that's kind of been my work for the last two years is um, um, do a capital campaign in order to, because uh, I believe we also need ownership. It's important for mm -hmm. black people to have ownership because when you have ownership, you have a little bit leverage. And it's all about supporting the black trans community, black and brown trans people to um, create uh, an um, uh, equity and equality and making sure that we have the resources to take care of ourselves. And one of the most heartbreaking thing to me um, of all the many trans people that have been murdered and we don't get to, by police, uh, state sanctioned violence, and we don't get to respond in the way that we need to. We don't get to run to Florida to support our um, community members because we don't we don't have the um, we don't have the equity in order for us to do that. And like, um, there's been a couple of trans people that have been um, murdered in. Um, Florida very, very recently, and we don't get to respond in the way that we need to be there. We don't get to go out and support those girls from the, and guys from those communities and just be there from them and, and just be that voice and um, be that person to help them doing what we're doing because a lot of uh, trans people, even working class trans people, we're all still struggling in a lot of ways for our survival and our existence. And we're also working hard to hold on 
to what little we have so that we have some type of legacy to lead. You know, Miss mm -hmm. Major Griffin Gracie, who is my trans mother, when I moved to San Francisco, I mean, she taught me everything I knew. And she also taught me things that um, if if she's not here, that I'm, I should do in order to create the equality that we need. And I feel very proud and honored that Miss Major is a living legend who is still here. You know what I mean? So I'm just, uh, those are the kind of things that I have to go to to make me happy. And just knowing that, I mean, many black trans people, but one black trans woman, like she really, really invested in me and really, really supported me and nurtured me. She taught me how to fight. She taught me how to have a voice. I mean, yes. and I hope that we could continue to replicate that within our communities. I, I so appreciate this. I also want to say just that fact that you gave us that there aren't um, businesses, property owned by black trans folk in San Francisco, a place that has a black woman mayor that has a queer district attorney um, that has to change. And, uh, and I think there's ways that, again, all of us can help to bring some pressure uh, to make that happen. So we will definitely send folks um, to your organization. I'm happy to know you have a capital campaign. Let's see what we can do to, to change that particular fact. And Thank you again so much. I really do feel like you you gave me not only critical analysis, but you reminded me of that importance of um, pouring into each other, of loving and mentoring each other, um, but also remembering that nobody's going to save us but ourselves. Janetta Johnson, Executive Director of TGI Justice Project. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Now, as we wrap for this week, I wanna to return to the question I posed at the start of the conversation. What is justice? This is a question for all of us, not only for the courageous advocates and organizers that you've met today. This week, ask yourself, what is justice and what can I do to advance the causes of justice? And then go ahead and act on that. Go to pflag.org and learn more about these organizers. But just keep it in your mind. Now, that's it for this episode of What Makes Pride, which is brought to you by PFLAG, the nation's largest family and ally organization. As always, I'm your host, Melissa Harris Perry. And thank you for joining us. And remember to tune in for next week's episode. We're going to take up the idea of community. To learn more about our guests and how to support their critical work, go to pflag.org. There you're going to find links, you're going to find suggested ways to support, and you're going to find ways to get involved. All right, y'all, stay as safe as you can, be good to one another, and have a little pride. <laughs>